Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of our podcast called Random Cricket Photos that make my guests happy. And before we introduce you to our guest for the day, here is a random cricket photo that makes me happy. The pitch today looks very good. It's a nice dry wicket. Magnificent shot, Greg Chappell. Beautiful placement. Jeez, what about that? This is a picture from a very popular series that happened in 2004 when India went across the border to play Pakistan in what was a historic cricket tour. In the photograph, we see Pakistani speedster Shoaib Akhtar applauding on one side while in the same frame we can see Sachin Tendulkar raising his bat after scoring a century in the second ODI held at Rahul Pindi. Now, Sachin Shoaib was easily one of the most mouth-watering of duels in cricket in 2000s and needless to say, both gave their 200% against each other to eke out a win for their respective teams. But what this photo captures is the beauty of the sport. Two fierce competitors going up against each other, yet not forgetting to appreciate the other when it is well deserved, is something that makes the spirit of cricket. And to see it being upheld in such a high octane series tells you why these cricketers were such massive figures on either sides of the border. That's why this photo is really iconic for me. What would cricket be without all its stories? In fact, what would cricket be without those who scrounge for those stories and bring them out for people like us to read? While you ponder about the answers to those questions, let me introduce you to one man who has been digging out stories from the game's glorious past for years and bringing them to us. Ladies and gentlemen, I have with me cricket historian Abhishek Mukherjee who has served as the chief editor of Cricket Country apart from writing about the game for several websites and publications. A big welcome to the podcast, Abhishekta. Thank you. I've been following your show for some time, following your site and your channel. So I I think it's an absolute privilege to be here. You know, I'll, I'll let out a secret at this point. I mean, all the big welcome and the long introduction, it's, it's all a part of a well-laid trap because, you know, the greedy man in me is looking forward to a lot of stories in this episode as you go through your list of five cricket photos that make you happy. But uh, before those stories, one story that I would like to know at the outset is, because you're a big book lover, so which book about the game was the first that you read? And that proved to be sort of the stepping stone as far as your love for the game, love for reading the game is concerned. Okay, so this was Runs and Ruins, Gavaskar's book. There was, there used to be a bookstall called Epic near my place. They lent out books for, lent out secondhand books for a charge. I think I was about seven, eight when I picked this book up from there or I mean definitely less than 10. So that was when it started. More I read, more I wanted to know about cricket of the era. This was just before my time. So you can understand the uh, 1987 World Cup was approaching and there was a big hype around 1983. So this was my window. So I started get, growing, developing an interest towards this era. And then with that, along with that, over time, I started developing an interest towards cricket history. First, uh, before the, this period, then across India, then across India, and then outside India. So that was, I suppose, how it started. Okay, as a you know, as a book lover myself, something that often happens to me is discovering books out of nowhere and sort of getting impressed by it, and eventually sort of ending up thanking my luck that I accidentally stumbled upon them. So is there any cricket book that you luckily came across and it turned out to be a fantastic read? And, and one more book related question while we are at it. Which book turned out to be say the best bargain in terms of quality and the price? In terms of quality, I had an unexpectedly good purchase. So there was a, a stock clearance sale. There was an offer. So, uh, I think at Crossword or Starmark, I obviously went there and it was a buy one, get one or buy two, get two or something like that. I don't exactly remember. 
so now i had the option of buying one more book so typically as it happens these places do not have this book section filled with rare books so i found one book that i had never read uh, alan ward's extraordinary cricket matches so over time this ended up being one of my go to books whenever i had to look up something or write on a particular match so this uh, this has been probably my greatest unexpected purchase i i've never heard of the book till then but i got it at something very cheap you can understand by one get one of quite the beginning to the journey and uh, another sub journey that we'll now shift our focus to will be the photographs from so many years of obsessing over the game that you have come to admire so without much further delay let's begin with our list but i believe before that list there is also a list of rejects right yeah this was a very difficult list to make so i had to leave out some of my favorites so let's begin with the list of rejects first yeah so the first one i suppose this is probably the best known photograph in the history of cricket if you talk to them you talk to historians great historians they'll tell you that no photograph captures the spirit of cricket of the golden age like this one look at how he has left the crease without any concern uh, i mean he has the tumper has committed himself entirely to the to the shot uh, i had uh, this is one photograph i feel very connected to but i had considered picking this one uh, but it really seems odd to talk about a photograph on which someone like gideon hay has written an entire book so this next one is so uh, this has a story so in the body line series bradman had missed the first test england won the test so now bradman has returned so australia want him to take revenge of the defeat in the first test now the expectations were enormous it's a packed house and now he walks out it's the first ball will be bowled by not lawood but bowes bowes was not as quick as lawood so bowes somehow figured out that bradman would anticipate a bouncer and bowes bowled uh, pitches this up bradman goes for a premeditated pull you can see he's nowhere he is no he is nowhere in position to play a pitched up ball this is a premeditated shot and he's bowled so now this pushes jardine into a celebratory dance jardine is not one to give in to reactions on field but jardine went on it was celebratory dance so that it was that big a moment now, this one is something you will not see today england have scored 903 hutton had 364 both are world records i know this was a timeless test but even then this pitch was so flat that the curator would have been slammed today i'm sure and here you see the pitch curator bossa martin posing proudly with the score card this one is from adelaide 1960-61 where mackay and klein batted for 101 minutes over 100 minutes for the last wicket to save the test not much in there but look at where the silly point is placed that is why this picture stands out the next one is from the old trafford test of 1961 simpson the ball you can see the ball has already crossed simpson he takes it with the wrong hand so if you look at the video this does not look anything spectacular but i don't think there has been i have not seen a ca better capture of a slip catch this is an excellent catch capture now this is uh, not much in the picture as you can see but the photograph has a back story so look at bedi's right thumb how he presses the ball with his right thumb into his left hand before release now ken kelly who had been around since the 1930s had been chasing bedi for four years for this one perfect capture bedi later confessed that he had never realized that he did this push and then there are two photographs i think everyone knows everything about the second tie test and this one that i consider the greatest one day international of all time these are i suppose universal favorites these are the ones that do not go into the list 
now tell us about the ones that make it to the list i mean you have set it up really well and you have got everyone excited i would say so let's begin the list with photo number 5 okay this one first of all the person you are looking at is bradman the batsman is bradman he is looking away from the bowler okay uh so let me explain what has happened this one, this is not from a test match this is from a sheffield shield match at the gabba it's 1931 32 now eddie gilbert was an aboriginal fast bowler it's a small frame about 5 feet 7 inches 57 kg not intimidating at all i mean a bowler of this frame the frame of like this cannot be considered intimidating at first look but he could generate serious pace and when i say serious pace it is absolutely serious pace now gilbert comes to bowl the second over of the innings the batsman is wendell bill he bowls a bouncer this is aimed at wendell bill's throat he just manages to glove it and is caught behind now bradman walks out this is a state match remember so uh, he is he has come off last year he is he is coming off a record tally of 974 runs in england in a single series this record still stands mind you several experts had predicted that bradman with his technique would not succeed in england but he scored 974 runs in five tests now he is coming out to bat in a state match everyone expects him to do well but now even bradman finds gilbert too quick the first ball is very fast now bradman is pushed back for pace but he keeps it out i mean after all he is bradman so he keeps it out the second one is a bouncer outside leg so no harm with that bradman bradman lets it go the the, th- the next ball the third ball bradman faces the fourth of the over this one beats bradman for pace the ball goes straight to the wicket keeper the ball after that now this is also too quick for bradman this one hits bradman on the underbelly so bradman loses the bat he falls on the ground he takes some time to recover and during this phase i mean you can see you can understand what is going on this is a state match i reminding again so a state match uh, gilbert is known for his pace but this was unexpected and uh, bradman somehow recovers now he has made up his mind uh, he decides to counter attack he had done that he has always done that he has always been an aggressive batsman whenever in uh, whenever the bowling has been hostile whenever the bowling has been difficult he has always tried to score quickly despite everything now he has made up his mind that he will go after it whatever happens it is almost predetermined now this one is also again too quick for him and bradman goes for a shot he top edges it and is caught behind now this caught behind bradman later wrote in his autobiography that the keeper took the ball over his head so the ball probably flew and bradman estimated that it was halfway to the boundary with the uh, with the keeper took it this means that the ball is in the air and the wicket keeper waterman i think will run further backward to take the catch he can if it's halfway between the wicket and the boundary line you can see the shadow of the first slip that is probably where he will take the catch so that is how i mean it is above bradman's head but it was it was it probably did not go that high you can also see bradman looking away from gilbert i don't know what shot he attempted but given gilbert's pace um i don't think he found enough time to turn around unless it was an absolute skyer so maybe it was a skyer i don't think we get to know but yeah okay i mean it was definitely too quick now this over shook up bradman he later confessed again in his autobiography that these five balls were the fastest that he ever faced remember he faced larwood yes this over also did something else brad uh, percy fender and some other experts in england had spotted 
Bradman's weakness against fast short pitch bowling aimed at the body. This was being discussed. Now these five balls probably confirmed that suspicion at least somewhat. The body line happened a year later. Bradman handled body line better than anyone, but his average, I mean, came down from superhuman to human. <laughs> What a way to put it. Now, yeah. So we talk a lot about holding over to boycott. There's a video of that on YouTube. Does not tell us a lot. We have seen flint offs over to Callis. That one is on YouTube. This over from Gilbert was not recorded, as, to my knowledge at least. But had it been, I think this would have been at par with any of these. There's also a sad part about Gilbert. Bradman wrote that he had a suspect action. Some experts like Alan McGilvray found it difficult to comment. Because he flung the right arm so fast that it was almost impossible to figure out. But Bradman and some others they called for a sus. Uh, they mentioned that he had a suspect action, but he was never called for chucky. But then again, Gilbert never played for Australia. As I mentioned, the body line series was next season. I don't know how that would have panned out had Gilbert played the match. Gilbert versus Larwood would have been a sight to watch. That's for sure. Totally, and you know what can be said about Don Bradman's stories: the more, the merrier. And this one is fairly rare as well. And you know, I'm just wondering about the burden of expectations that he must have had to deal with after scoring 974 runs, and you know, people must be expecting him to just blow away all the domestic bowlers. And then this little-known duel happens. So yeah, a little known uh, bowler troubling a man who has just been elevated to the status of cricketing god. But what a picture! What a backstory! No, and then when you talk about uh, expectations on Bradman, it was not only about cricketing expectation. See, Australia were going through um, economic depression in the late 1920s. So um, since the conditions were really bad, and uh, They wanted some kind of icon, so Bradman was that sort of. He did not do anything financially, but he provided them with that inspiration. Australia has always been a country um, who have depended, who have taken uh, sports seriously, and now Bradman, after he after that 1930 tour. Was more than a cricketing hero. He was almost sort of um, what? What do you say? And a source of inspiration for a lot of people, for a lot of Australians back home. That England ruled over Australia for a long time. Now, one of their own, um, a middle-class cricketer, is going out there and dominating the Englishmen at their end. That was more than cricket. So that added to the expectations, I suppose. Definitely, without a doubt, and well, didn't he live up to those expectations? Okay, moving on. What would be the fourth on the list? What comes next after this? So, uh, this is from the Old Trafford Test of 1961. Australia hold the Ashes, so they need to draw the series to retain it. The scoreline needs uh, the three. This is the fourth test. The scoreline needs one one. So England can still come back and regain the Ashes. This is the final day. England have to score two fifty six in two thirty minutes to win the Test. The first wicket falls quickly and Dexter comes out. Now this is one of those Dexter days. The, when Dexter played, he was absolutely unstoppable. He smashes the bowlers around, scores seventy six in I think eighty four minutes. But Aman Subbara is holding the other end up. England are past 130, 140 with one wicket down. Now there's a backstory to this. I mean, backstory to what will follow next. Beno had met Lindwall the previous day after the match, after the day's play in the evening. So he had told Lindwall that he might come round the wicket to hit the rough to both left-handers and right-handers. Lindwall warned Beno that he will be hammered if he was not very accurate. But Beno took the risk. Now he switches to round the wicket. The first ball is a long hop, and Dexter hits four. Another long hop. This time 
Dexter tries to cut, the ball takes the top edge and Brout takes a very good catch. So now the stage is set. Peter May walks out. At that point, Peter May was probably, probably just past his prime, but he was still one of the best batsmen. So 150 for two, 106 required, 105 minutes left, eight wickets in hand. The match is absolutely set. There's a very solid Raman Subbara at the other end. Now, Beno's first ball is on leg stump. He defends it. And Beno is furious with himself. He keeps telling himself, get it out further, you idiot. This is not the Richie Beno we know in the commentary box. No marvelous and that kind of thing. This is he the is Australian captain. Angry. Yeah. Now, Beno comes. Beno goes. Beno bowls the ball from almost the corner of the crease. You can see where he is standing. Remember, he has come on his follow through. So he has come somewhat towards the left after release, at least some distance. So even then, look at where he is standing. So he's bowled from as, as far as possible. Bowls it as far as possible outside the leg stump. May tries to sweep and is bowled round the legs. The angle is almost absurd if you think about it. Now, if you look at the photograph today, it doesn't look like much of a sweep. May probably did not do the full thing. He probably did not go down on one knee. Uh, not the kind, not the shot we think of when we discuss a sweep today. But all newspaper accounts, all eyewitness accounts, Beno's own account, they all mention a sweep. Now, Beno writes uh, in his book on this test, that he saw the path, entire path of the thing. Again, you can imagine how, how far uh, he was bowling from. You can see Beno celebrating now. Uh, he was probably the pioneer of the exuberant celebrations we see today. If you see Jim Laker's 10 wickets, they were just shaking hands. Jim Laker taking 19 wickets, the fielders just shaking hands with him. So Beno was probably, the, again, something that doesn't go, doesn't tally with his commentary box image. So well, a lot changed over the years when he made it to the commentary box, I believe. Yes. So Beno also wrote that the there was a fraction of a second when he had to wait for the ball after pitching to hit the leg stump. So once it hit the leg stump, he let go of what he writes, and this is the exact phrase, an unrestrained yell of joy. And you can actually see that happening. Totally. And Peter May had no clue what had happened. He was in shock. You can almost see that in the photograph. Grout had to tell him that he had been bowled round the legs. He had to explain, the wicketkeeper had to explain him that he had been bowled round the legs. So that is where it dawned upon him. This is and years uh, before Vaughn would do that to so many batsmen. Yes. And now the floodgates opened and England were bowled out for 201. So one of them was the Simpson catch that I had to reject. So that is one. You know, since you talked about this wonderful picture of Richie Beno and uh, we are down that road of storytelling, there is a little Beno story I would like to add as well, just, just for our viewers maybe. So this one finds mention in uh, Amol Rajan's book on spinners called Twirly Men and the story goes that a young Richie Beno who had contracted dengue fever in India in 1956. Few months after that, he went to New Zealand with the Australian team. And in this little known place in New Zealand called Timaru, he went up to the chemist for medicines to help him recover from the after effects of that dengue fever. Now, the chemist who had treated many ex-servicemen for ulcers caused by gassing he was kind of surprised to see the lacerations on Beno's fingers and of course he didn't know him at that point. So he asked the customer what was the reason behind those lacerations and that's when Beno told him that he is a leg spinner and these cuts were actually affecting his ability to bowl. And this man, James, uh, suggested him to try something called oily calamine lotion which according to Beno went a long way in healing and protecting his fingers. And we know what he did with those fingers in the years that followed. So, so yeah, that anecdote in that book, you know, ends with this beautiful little afterthought 
that what would have happened had Beno approached that chemist with his left hand instead of right. You know, of course, the fingers on the left hand would not have been in that dilapidated state. But well, how the world's batsman would have wished that he had actually approached the chemist with the left hand. So little beautiful story there. Uh, moving on, what would be the next photograph? Okay. Now there are multiple versions of this photograph. I'm choosing this not for the exact angle or the quality of the photograph, but for the subject and the context. You have to understand the situation here. This is India's first match of the 2017 World Cup. They are playing England. England are, uh, I mean, they also, they were, they are one of the strongest sites in the world. England would go on to win the World Cup, that World Cup. They were also playing at home. Now in the World Cup before that, in 2013, India were playing at home. They had finished seventh out of eight teams. It was their worst show uh, of the century. Which means that they had to, they had a lot to prove here against a really formidable opposition at their den. So it's a big match. Now Poonam Raut and Smriti Mandana are out there batting. Mitali Raj is next, paired up in the dugout. And she's reading a book. She's reading Rumi. You can see her body language. It is almost as if she's not concerned about what is going on out there. When her times come, she'll simply pick up a bat and get to business. Now, had I been the opposition, I would have I would have been really unnerved by this. You remember, Steve Waugh used to talk about mental disintegration while referring to sledging around, I mean, when the great Australian side emerged. Now, that sledging might not always have an impact on the opposition, but I am sure that the next batter reading a book in the dugout would definitely have had an impact. Of course, she later told that she, she always reads before going out to bat before, because it keeps her calm. She usually, usually carries a Kindle, but they were not allowed Kindles during matches. So she borrowed a book from the fielding coach. So there was uh, probably no effort at an actual mental disintegration or anything of the sort, but it definitely had some effect. It must have had some kind of effect. And the best bit is, once the wicket fell, she just picked up the bat and scored 71 and 73 balls, just like that. And India won the match. Really, how cool. And not any bit surprised that, you know, in a list of favorite cricket photos by a bibliophile, there is a photo of a cricketer reading a book. I should have totally seen that coming. But seriously, this is one beautiful photograph went viral on social media for obvious reasons. And, you know, we always talk about the calm and composure of a Mahindra Singh Dhoni, but this picture is calm and composure personified. What comes after this? What is the penultimate picture on that list? We know this photograph. All of us have seen this. All, every cricket lover has seen this picture at some point in their lives. So, I won't go through the entire test. But Australia needed one run in the last two balls of the test. It's the last wicket. Hall is the bowler. Klein plays to square leg. Solomon picks it up and hits the wickets with a direct hit. Mekif is run out and it is the first tied test. This much we know. Now, uh, before going into, there's a backstory to this, before going into that, there are some things that I need to point out first. The two men near the stumps are Sobers and Tanhain. Sobers had come in, come in from leg slip, uh, Klein batted left-handed. He's uh, the one standing next to the stumps. Now, Kanhai was fielding at around short point. Remember, a left-handed batsman. When the ball goes to square leg, Kanhai runs to the stumps to cover the throw. The ball hits the stump directly. Kanhai, can, Kanhai was probably in the best position to realize that it is out. He, he turns around, looks at the umpire, see, watches his reaction, watches that uh, he knows he has been given out and he starts celebrating. Now, if you watch the video of this moment, you'll never notice Kan that Kanhai has jumped. So, uh, I was reading a book, Patrick Agar's 150 Years of Cricket Photography. Ron, Levi Ron Lovett was the person who clicked this photograph. So, Agar writes there that Lovett waited for an extra split second, which made, which allowed him, which helped him to capture Tanhai in that posture. It is not evident in the video. Now, the person at extreme left may or may not be Solomon. I'm not sure. 
if it is indeed him it makes the capture perfect because he has just thrown this comes down uh if you watch the video again he will just be charging in now to celebrate now there are a couple of other things i think that is hall who has just bowled the ball which is uh, i mean hands aloft he's he's still not celebrating now instead of throwing it at the striker's end had solomon gone for the other end he would probably have found it very difficult to throw it past hall you can see that yeah and klein if you notice had not reached the non striker's end in fact he is uh, watching the ball had he done this today a lot of commentators would have criticized him for doing this definitely all this was probably due to the mounting tension yes this was definitely due to the mounting tension i really wonder how the photographer kept his nerve there's another story to this uh, you can see the west uh, west indian celebrating here i have always wondered why uh, of course they were the only side who could have lost the test at this point because the worst that could have happened to australians uh, would have would have been a tie which is what happened but only recently i found out there was more to it than that uh this december charles davis we, have, we all know charles davis wrote about an interview of paul hoy from a 1978 issue of the cricketer hoy was one of the umpires in that test now hoy told that the scoreboard at the gabba had missed a buy of the first ball of the last over the scorers got it right but the, the scoreboard at the ground had got had missed it they could not make it make up for it during this tense last over this meant that the west indians probably thought that the, that australia needed two and not one when the last when this ball was bowled I, i suppose that justifies the celebrations even more now um there is another story to this now, before this ball is bowled uh, as we know worrell goes up to hall and tells him remember west if you bowl a no ball you'll never be able to go back to barbados if the scores are level of course and then that calms everyone down hall returns to the mark and the ball is bowled now a lot happened in that one minute or two minutes or whatever time it took the photograph this foot i mentioned this photograph was taken by ron lovett lovett work for the age and now what happened has two versions this first version has been told by both frank keating and patrick ega so apart from lovett harry martin of the herald was the other main photographer at the time now both men i mean there's been a lot in the, in the last days cricket so both men are down to their last films and now uh, with the scores level they are almost certain that this is going to be the deciding ball they are from rival newspapers both of them wanted the best pictures so they don't talk a lot they are rivals but now a desperate situation has arrived so they have to collaborate now so they now decide to toss a coin the condition is uh, whoever gets heads would focus on the wicket while the other man would follow the ball now martin calls tails the photograph you see was clicked by lovett now uh, there's another story that i recently came across this is by lovett's colleague bruce possel before the day's play lovett had clicked the picture of the governor of queensland for a feature and it kept the negative aside in a folder that told that held two negatives so that so basically he has one unused negative now lovett had 24 negatives saved for the day's cricket and now he has run out of all negatives so now there's one over left this is the last over of the match and lovett realizes that he has run out of film he has that one negative left and he has no clue when to use it this is an eight ball over and he doesn't know which will be the decisive ball so now the first ball hits grout on the stomach they run a bye the next ball hall uh, hall bounces beno is caught behind the third is a dot ball the fourth ball hall misses an easy run out valentine stops the overthrow the fifth ball kanha is ready to take a catch at square leg hall also wants the catch uh, in the confusion the catch is dropped there's a run the sixth ball 
Hunt throws directly from deep square leg and Grout is run out while attempting a third run. So now the scores are level. As I mentioned, I mean, Lovett must have been sure that this is the decisive ball. This was a gamble, remember, because had this been a dot ball, a normal dot ball, had the seventh ball been the normal dot ball, he would probably have missed out had he clicked. But now they have decided. So now he has to take a chance. Otherwise, he may miss the big moment. So he goes ahead. Now the two stories do not, uh, if you notice, they do not exactly contradict each other. Maybe this was when Lovett approaches, approached Martin. For the toss. Or maybe, huh. So uh, they do not exactly contradict each other, but there's no overlap either. So I suppose both are true and whatever it is, it makes for a very compelling photograph with a long backstory. Absolutely. I mean, iconic test match, iconic photograph. Everyone has seen it, but I had zero idea about so many stories behind it. And probably that's the reason you are the guest on the podcast while I'm just linking one picture to the other in the list with some, you know, random connecting words. So yet another wonderful addition to the list, which now piques my curiosity about the picture that occupies number one position on that list has to be very special. What is it? Okay. In another time, I don't think this would have been among my top five pictures, or even top 10, 10 pictures. As you can see, there's nothing spectacular about the photograph. It is unclear, grainy. I can see a lot of smoke in the background, but there's a backstory, backstory behind the uh, smoke, behind everything, which is what makes it so special. This photograph was played during, uh, taken during the Second World War, I think around 1944. They used to have these matches during the war, some for fundraising and some to serve as moral boosters for the public, some sort of entertainment. There was nothing going on. So this was a one inning match between the army and the RAF at Lords. There were about 3000 people, which was a decent turnaround for a wartime crowd. Remember, this was an era when families often stayed away from London, the working or sometimes the working parents stayed over here. Even sometimes the, only the working father stayed over here. They sent away the children to the countryside. And so, the, I mean, this was a decent crowd. Crowd. It doesn't seem much, but uh, it was a decent wartime crowd. And now, uh, this was a star-studded match, actually. The Army had Gabby Allen, Godfrey Evans, Maurice Leland, Dick Pollard, Jack Robertson, Charlie Palmer, Raf had Wally Hammond, Rick Simpson, Bob Wyatt, David Townsend, Les Ames, Charlie Barnett, Bill Edrich. So, big names. Most of them test cricketers. And most of them big names. So the army, the army bat first. They are 57 for one. Wyatt is bowling to Robertson. Wyatt uh, had captained England 16 times in the 1930s. But now he's on duty. He's a flight officer. Robertson is a lieutenant. He played 11 tests after the war. Averaged 46. Would probably have played more. Had he not, as his career not coincided with one of the strongest batting lineups, probably England's best ever side in the, in the early 1950s or in the mid 1950s, I guess. Now there's a noise at the ground. The score is 57. There's a noise at the ground. Now everyone in both army and RAF knows what this is, a German aircraft. It is approaching the ground. It is designed to crash and explode the moment it crashes. So this is sort of, I mean, it could have landed on them or near them, anything. So the cricketers follow the drill and throw themselves on the ground. The crowd also takes cover. I mean, they must have been trained. They must have been told what to do uh, when, they, uh, when a doodle bug approached. So eyewitnesses later told that for a moment it seemed it would crash on the practice ground. But in the end, it fell about 200 years, yards short, probably near Regent's Park. Now you can see the smoke, the smoke I mentioned. The danger has passed now. The cricketers, instead of calling the match off, most teams would have called this match off. But the cricketers, instead of calling this match off, decide to continue because they are war-hardened people. They are not only cricketers, they are war-hardened people. They are out there with a mission. 
so they decide to continue but everyone is obviously tense the first ball goes by the second ball is a bouncer and robertson hooks it for six and the sort of there's a the spell breaks this was probably the biggest mood lifter that could ever be now um if you think uh, things are not much different right now in fact it's probably worse people are dying by the thousands of around the world the resources are running out there's a severe food crisis as we know nobody knows when this is going to end so now maybe i mean uh, we are all hoping for a recovery maybe we need a sign that will tell us that the worst is behind us we shall recover cricket will resume it's only a matter of time that moment is probably just one six of it. we probably need something like a a day, uh, war war plane aim for us landing just short of the ground so that kind of hope is something we need quite an apt entry at number 1 for someone who is also a major lover of history and yeah in in times like this this photo really is much needed sort of you know to put perspective to things and uh, well this photo itself tells you how things were just not normal normalcy was suspended otherwise we would not have players lying on the cricket field but you know the way you told the story i think it was also probably the only silver lining in the lives of these people who were playing and who were so terribly affected by war but also hardened by it so quite an incredible picture and especially given the times that we are living in where hope is much needed and probably someone will hit that six to lift our spirits up soon now to the final segment of the show which we call the one that got away where we ask our guest about a photograph that hasn't been captured but it was an iconic moment would have made for a great photograph but that's how things worked out and there exists no photograph of it so which moment from cricket would you like to talk about in this section okay uh um... So this is Arthur Gilligan's side, Arthur Gilligan's MCC tour in England in 1926-27. This is a very strong side, and we have been playing cricket for some time, but we're yet to earn respect from the big sides. Now Gilligan's side was still undefeated in the tour. Here they scored. They were playing against the Hindus. Remember, the, this was the era of the quadrangular. Uh, did the slate become the pentangular then sides were sides are presented religions now they scored 363 the hindus were 67 for 2 and ck naidu walks out so he takes on stuart boys the first six lands on the roof of the pavilion the next two land on the tents so evot astil then drops naidu and naidu hits four sixes of evot astil so now morris state is the best bowler of the side probably that is why he got spared naidu hit him for only fours there was no six so he went after bob white now he hit two consecutive balls on the roof of the gym khana and he scored 153 in 100 minutes 11 fours 13 sixes the crowd kept swelling all the while people kept coming in news got around they kept coming in from all around bombay uh, i've read a lot about naidu he used to be his back used to be ramrod straight even in his later age he was a clean straight hitter uh, they talked him this bat came like a pendulum when he hit i really wish there was a photograph of the of at least one of his sixes if not more and then uh, okay more about the tour later in the tour later in the tour professor devdhar scored 148 in 4 hours and it's the same say devdhar was 53 at this point the two innings especially nainus now they impressed gilligan so much that gilligan promised to talk to mcc about a tour india an indian tour of england he also asked the indians to form a board so this was in 2627 bcci was formed in 1938 india toured england in 1932 they played the first test there the year after that england toured india all that would probably have been delayed by a few years had ck not played that innings even if one ignores the quality of the innings i mean i would really have wanted to see one of the sixes you cannot ignore the significance of the innings 
So it was it would probably have been a spectacular photograph as well as a significant photograph. It sounds like the zeroth moment of Indian cricket, you know, from yes. the moment of genesis, the moment of the beginning of uh, Indian cricket and the English the tours to England that have that happened afterwards and you know things that followed that possibly would not have happened had it not been for those sixes and those that innings. So Indians have beaten touring English sides, but no side before Gilligan's was this strong. So this was a really strong side that could be for the first time. Great. So thank you so much, Abhishek. Da, this was always going to be a great episode, but uh, you know, at the end of it, I feel it turned out to be even better than I expected. So many stories, so many iconic photographs, and uh, all all thanks to you. Hope you had a good time on the show. Yeah, definitely, it has been a privilege. Great. Thank you so much once again. So that brings us to the end of a super fun and super informative episode. Big thanks to Abhishek Mukherjee for joining us. We'll be back again with yet another episode very soon. But before we go, here is a question for this episode. So, we associate a lot of numbers with Donald Bradman. We know his average, we know the number of centuries he scored. You have to tell me the number of ducks that Donald Bradman scored in his test career. We'll be back again with another guest, another fun episode. Till then, stay happy, love cricket.